Kentucky, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on our organization. Our organization is a, probably a little over two years old now and growing uh, each and every day. We get new folks who are interested in getting involved in the conversation regarding keratoconus and other forms of uh, corneal lactatic disease. We have an absolutely stellar uh, executive uh, board, as you can see on the list, of folks who have just the, the greatest reputation in the field of keratoconus that you would know of, both in medicine and in optometry. And uh, we're also in the uh, process of forming our uh, medical and optometric advisory board, so be on the lookout for that. So what is the role of IKA? Why are we in existence, and, and what are we trying to do? Well, really, it comes down to the fact that there's just so much new information that we're learning about keratoconus, both in terms of early diagnosis and in terms of treatment and management. And the opportunity that we're going to be able to have to really have an impact on this disease and impact our patients' lives uh, is, is quite amazing. So our mission truly is to spread the word. Our, our concept is to get eye care professionals of all uh, disciplines involved in this activity, to share thoughts, to share ideas, and to really raise the bar uh, so that we can help our patients lead more productive, better quality lives. So we have a, a pretty a robust um, website, and when you do, hopefully you will or have joined IKA, you'll have access to the website where we have lots of information, we share thoughts, we share ideas, there are articles and other uh, types of uh, materials that you can download for your own use. If you have things you want to share, you can upload it to the website. We have a very active uh, email listserv where uh, we communicate to each other via email as a group. And uh, it's really been exciting over the last year when we've become active in that regard. In addition, we do have a Facebook page, as you can see towards the bottom, that also ideas are shared. So those of you who aren't members of IKA, please go to www.keratoconusacademy.com like you see on your screen. And if you go to the area that says subscribe, you'll notice that there is actually a, a sort of a coupon code. And utilization of that coupon code allows you to become a member without any fee, at least for the next year. And as long as we get uh, ongoing support, uh, we hope to continue that. Um, thank you to our sponsors to allow us to do that. So once you get to the subscribe area, you can fill out the information. It takes about 24 to 48 hours for that application to go through the process for approval. Sometimes it's very quick, but sometimes it could take a day or two. So uh, please be patient with that as well. And we really wouldn't be in existence if it weren't for our industry sponsors, to be honest with you. Oculus has been phenomenal to IKA, as have been the other groups who are just major industry sponsors. And we hope to expand this list of folks who have an interest in helping people with keratoconus. And again, thank you so much to our industry sponsors. So we're going to just go through a couple of quick disclosure slides of all of us in advance so that we can move right into the important materials tonight. Here's my disclosure slide. We're following with Dr. Tulo, who will be speaking to you also later this evening. Uh, Dr. Chang, who will be speaking to you at the next webinar um, uh, a, a week from today. And of course, Dr. Morgan Stern, who also is on the uh, webinar with us uh, this evening. So let's begin. I'm going to do just a little introduction and hand it over to uh, Andy and Bill. So there was a paper that was published in Cornea back in 2015 that I believe somewhere down later along in the webinar series, I, I believe Dr. Uh, Morgan Stern will go into some detail about the outcomes of this paper. But it really was an amazing uh, paper in the fact that in our uh, knowledge, this was the first attempt at coming up with some sort of consensus on the diagnosis, definition, and management of keratoconus. Now granted, uh, although the, this is a stellar group of keratoconus experts uh, who published this particular paper, there were some significant and glaring uh, weaknesses as well, and Andy will uh, go over that when he does review the paper. But suffice to say that the effort, the important effort that was put in place to come up with this paper, in other words, what we really need is to come to some sort of consensus in understanding this disease, how we diagnose the disease, and how we manage the disease. This is very, very critical and really is at the cornerstone of what IKA is all about. Well, 
you know what, keratoconus has a tremendous uh, impact on our patients' lives. And we typically spend, what, 10, 15, maybe 30 minutes with our patients annually who have keratoconus. And we don't really understand the impact that this disease has on their lives. About a year ago, I started to join on to some of these Facebook group pages that are really run by patients who have keratoconus, sharing their thoughts, their ideas, and their questions. And it's been amazing and quite enlightening for me to hear how this disease impacts their lives. So I've actually just written down here, and I'll share with you in just a moment, just two of many, many quotes that I took off of one of those sites that really encapsulates how this disease can impact our patients. Take a look at this first one. Patient says, I'm really trying to have positive thoughts and attitudes as I deal with keratoconus, but some days it's hard. You never really know what you have till it's gone. Every waking moment we use our eyes, so every waking moment I'm reminded of this struggle. I want to do all that I can to help my vision get better. And sometimes things get a little dark. In fact, they can get quite dark for some patients. And look at this quote from an unfortunate patient with keratoconus. This patient said, I want to take my life. Because of keratoconus, I can't see proper. My friends and fam don't care. So you can see the, the psychological impact that this disease can have on your patient. Sometimes we really don't appreciate it. It can get as bad as maybe even some patients consider uh, taking their lives, which is just the most horrible thing. Well, not to stay on the negative, let's kind of move to the positive. And that's, again, really at the cornerstone of what IKA is all about because there's been a tremendous paradigm shift in our way of looking at this disease, keratoconus. And the reason is because we now can stop progression of the disease. And with that, we can preserve vision. So therefore, early detection becomes critically important. We all know that here in the US, uh, the first approval for corneal cross-linking was received earlier this spring with Avidro, with their Epi-Off uh, procedure. And we know that that's just going to be the first step in many to allow us to have control over the progression and natural course of this disease. And that's really, again, one of the most important concepts I want everybody to keep in mind. It's now becoming our responsibility to make early diagnosis in this disease. So let's take a look at an example that I've shared with others in the past. This was a patient I saw now almost two years ago. She came in because she was referred for contact lens management. And she was not doing that well in her current contact lenses. And obviously, uh, you can see those of us who are familiar with looking at Pentacam um, outcomes for keratoconus. This is a moderately advanced keratoconic. No, nobody would doubt that this patient has keratoconus. But the point was, that this patient came into the office being driven by her son. Her son was age 28 at the time, and, asked, and I asked how his vision was. And when he had his last eye exam, and he said to me, basically, he had perfect vision. He hadn't had an eye exam for over five years ago, but he knows he sees perfectly, and he didn't see any reason to go for an eye exam. His uncorrected vision, because I actually measured it, was actually 2015 in each eye. I asked him if he would mind if I took a look at his eyes. He said, sure, while I'm here, why not? Don't charge me, but take a look. In any case, uh, his slit lamp was absolutely normal. And I, again, asked him if he wouldn't mind if we ran that uh, very sensitive test that measures the shape of his cornea. And I want to share with you what we found. Take a look. We can see here in this particular patient who had absolutely 2015 vision, uncorrected, with no slit lamp signs, that patient definitively has keratoconus. We can see the elevation anomalies on the front and back of the cornea, and we'll learn so much more about how to interpret a pentacam in the uh, next series uh, that we're going to do next week. And um, we can even see that corneal curvature uh, evaluations in the upper left side are actually abnormal, as are the uh, pachymetric or the corneal thickness findings. So what about this particular case? We said to him, you know, young man, you're only 28 years old. You have a high probability of your disease getting worse. And we hope it would not develop into the stage that your mom is, but you have a definitive chance, a very high chance that that would occur. And we recommended strongly that he had uh, cro corneal cross-linking, and in fact he did, and in fact he's been stable ever since. So we really believe that we preserved his vision and that we really saved him from uh, a future that was quite, um, quite significantly negative as a potential. So the management key is now early detection, and you'll see as we move along through the webinars how we can do that with some of the new and advanced technologies. 
So a review of what we're going to talk about in the webinars tonight, we're going to talk about disease background and primary care diagnosis. And that will be handled by Drs. Morgan, Stern, and Tulo. On the 31st, we'll talk about advanced technologies for early diagnosis in order to preserve vision. And myself and Dr. Tulo will present that. And the final webinar, number three, which will be on the 7th of September, will be about treatment modalities, optical, medical, and surgical. And Drs. Morgan, Stern, and Chang will handle that. So it's very exciting to be able to share with you uh, all of the information that's coming out. And these are just the first steps. We know that over time there'll be newer and newer information, and we'll need to do other uh, webinars and other meetings. And we hope if all of you join in with IKA, you will be able to get the earliest access to this information. Because our ultimate goal is to have happy patients, happy doctors, far less corneal transplants, and we want to preserve vision. So at this point, I'm going to ask that we hand over control and the slides over to Dr. Morgan Stern, who will start telling you a little bit background about keratoconus. Thank you very much. All right, great. This is Andy Morgan Stern. Uh, I am an optometrist in Bethesda, Maryland, and I have my uh, email up on the screen right now for those of you who want to um, give me an email after this. Uh, I will ask Dr. Ryden or oops. so I Dr. sorry about Morning, that. Go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Hold on one second. I'm getting to share my screen right now. Can you see my screen right now, Chris? There you go. You got it. Okay. Excellent. So uh, can you guys hear me okay as well, Chris? Is that okay? Yeah, sounds good. Excellent. And I was just wondering if somebody uh, could post the link, the uh, YouTube link to our video that posted today at some point in the uh, uh, screen to all the participants. So what I am going to do now, start from the beginning. I'm from Bethesda, Maryland. And uh, you can see my email up on the screen. Chris, does my screen look okay to you? Yeah, you're, you're good to go. Okay, great. So uh, basically, here's my email if you want have any questions. And I just want to, just like Barry said before, I thank Oculus for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, the reason why it's so important to um, really thank this company um, is because when we sat down with them, uh, we said, hey, we, we've got all this keratoconus information. Uh, we know we use your device for a lot of stuff, but we've got to get this information out through the uh, International Keratoconus Academy. And I will tell you, at zero points in time, for anything that we asked of them to, uh, to get this information out, we have never heard the word no. Not once, not ever. And Oculus has been incredibly supportive of not only our patients, uh, but our industry as well in trying to get this information out. So I really can't thank Oculus enough. They are an absolute pleasure to work with. Here are my disclosures. Uh, we put them up before, and uh, I do have to say that I do work with the government uh, sometimes, the Vision Center of Excellence, and this is my opinion only, and it has nothing to do with any U.S. government um, information. So really the first question that I want to ask is, you know, what is keratoconus? And like we said, we're going to go into that paper later on in the web series on the agreement, the global consensus of keratoconus, but just to, to just to tap the tip of the iceberg. We know it's a disease of the cornea. We know it is a collagen-based disease. Uh, the big question of is it a unilateral or bilateral condition? Well, we know that this is a bilateral condition. It is a progressive, uh, asymmetric, bilateral condition. So if a patient comes into your office and you suspect whatever by whatever means necessary that you use, uh, and I know Dr. Tulo is going to go into a couple of those things, whether you use a retinoscope or a slit lamp or a, a placido disc imager or a penicam or whatever, if you suspect that a patient has keratoconus in one eye, you better be looking at the other eye. And just like Barry showed on his um, uh, familial scan that he did, not only do you need to look at the other eye, but you need to look at biological relatives as well. You know, from all of the webinars that we're going to be I mean, we're going to be presenting a ton of information, but there's some basic stuff they want every single person to walk away with. Uh, number one is to screen biological relatives, uh, and number two is identification uh, is critical to be done early because if we, 
you know, identify this stuff early enough, and that's what this device is, is incredible at, um, then we can, once the identification process happens, we can now treat. You know, prior to corneal cross-linking, uh, yeah, we can prescribe contact lenses, yeah, we can uh, improve vision with some lenses, uh, but really the only treatment there was out there was corneal surgery, and typically full thickness corneal surgery. And uh, to have a procedure like this, where we actually uh, don't have to remove diseased tissue and replace it with cadaver tissue, that's a pretty cool thing. Um, so who should know this information? Everybody should know this information. This is not an optometry thing. This is not an ophthalmology thing. This is not an optician or, an, or a uh, um, ophthalmic technician thing. Everybody needs to know this. And like Barry was saying before, I cannot stress to you enough how much input there is from the public and from patients on social media that's out there. Uh, yeah, Barry pulled uh, two amazingly powerful emotional quotes, but to talk to your patients and understand a day in the life of a keratoconus patient, um, and looking at it online, I think there's one keratoconus group of patients that has over 11,500 members uh, on a keratoconus page. So we're not talking about a small amount of people here. And really understanding um, this disease in that you wake up in the morning and it's there. And it's the, la you know, it's the first thing that you see when you wake up in the morning and it's the last thing that you see before you go to bed is this disease. And every single blink and every single visual task that these patients have to go through throughout the day is done through a distorted cornea. And if, you know, I don't care if it's keratoconus or diabetes that you have to look at that way uh, or in anything, if, if you have a health issue that you have to deal with 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it doesn't matter how minor it is, it is a huge problem to that patient. And obviously, you know, uh, there have been Gallup polls that have, done, that have been done where, you know, people uh, even rank loss of vision uh, higher as a problem <laughs> or a worry than loss of life. Uh, so th this is incredibly important, and we really have to be aware of what our patients are thinking about. So there's a lot of terms that are always constantly thrown around in our profession. And here's a, a pretty quick definition of things that we like to describe them as. But as we get into that paper of that global consensus, we're going to learn a lot more about them. Uh, things like ectasia, keratoectasia, keratoconus, form frust keratoconus, subclinical keratoconus, and iatrogenic keratoectasia. Uh, all of these are really part of the same family under the header of ectasia. And we're going to get into this a lot deeper and understand uh, what these conditions actually are. And to be perfectly honest with you, I think a lot of them are really variants of the same thing, uh, where ectasia, which is the you know, thinning and elevation of the cornea and a bulging of the tissue and a weakness of the tissue, these all fall under that same header. So it really kind of makes sense. Uh, and the fact that a, um, uh, you know, a, essentially a dictionary of these terms has been built finally, it's, it's a great thing. So here is this paper, and this is just the, the overlying um, message of this cornea paper uh, from uh, uh, Cornea, which is the Academy of Ophthalmology's um, subspecialty journal in uh, cornea and external disease, and that the following findings are mandatory to diagnose keratoconus. Uh, abnormal posterior elevation, abnormal corneal thickness distribution, and clinical non-inflammatory corneal thinning. And I think one of the things that you have to realize in that first statement, that's probably one of the most powerful statements in the entire study, is that not once in this definition and findings that are mandatory to diagnose keratoconus is measurement of the curvature of the front surface of the cornea. And that's really important because the, you know, in well over 90% of optometry offices today, uh, the most widely used uh, device to measure whether or not a patient has keratoconus to most uh, ODs and lots and lots of MDs is a corneal topographer, which really curvature and not elevation. And uh, that's important, and obviously some people are using OCTs now, but the reality is is that all along 
um, we were typically taught to look for keratoconus by looking for the red spot on the front surface curvature map of a placido disc image. And if you look at this definition, like I said, abnormal posterior elevation, well, that's not looked at by a placido disc imager. Abnormal corneal thickness distribu distribution, that's not looked at by a placido disc imager. And clinical non-inflammatory corneal thinning, and that's not looked at by a placido disc imager. So the question is, is that if this paper truly is that much of a landmark study in how to diagnose keratoconus, and we don't have that equipment in our office, are we picking up this disease early enough? And my answer to that is probably not. And that is why I have become incredibly dependent on Scheinflug style cameras. Uh, specifically, uh, obviously they invited me to speak on this call. My favorite by far is the Pentacam. Uh, and quite frankly, I don't think I can go to work anymore uh, doing what I do in the world of cornea and external disease and refractive surgery without a Pentacam. Uh, and uh, that is a statement I would stand behind uh, any day of the week. Uh, so keratoconus and pellucid marginal degeneration are different clinical presentations of the same disease. And the aspects that distinguish keratoconus, pellucid, and keratoglobus from each other is thinning location and pattern. So one of the things that we looked at wasn't where is the curvy spot, uh, like on a, on a uh, placido disc imager, but how is the entire cornea working? How is the uh, cornea, uh, you know, how is that presentation happening? from the front side to the back side of the cornea, and what's the thickness distribution? Because if you think about it, it really makes sense. We all know that corneas get thinner um, when they're keratoconic. So if you have a front surface curvature that starts to bulge forward and nothing happens to the back surface, the back surface stays completely static, doesn't change in curvature or elevation, but the front surface bulged forward, that would, descend, that would make the cornea thicker and not thinner. So really, if you think about it, the only way for a cornea to get thinner is if the back surface of the cornea moves more forward than the front surface does. That's the only way that relative change between those two surfaces can actually make the cornea thinner. And that is the, jet, the, basic, the most basic principle of Penicam. What the Penicam is doing is looking at the elevation on the front surface of the cornea, the elevation on the back surface of the cornea, and checking the distance in between. And we know that you can't have thinning unless the back surface moves forward at a more rapid pace than the front surface. And the only way to do that is to have a device that can look at both surfaces at the same time. Uh, so we know that keratoglobus and keratoconus are two completely different clinical entities. Um, it was also part of the global consensus panel, uh, and this is going to be repeated in my presentation, uh, probably in Dr. Chang's presentation, probably in, in Dr. Iden's next presentation. True unilateral keratoconus really does not exist, and that you may have a patient that is, uh, uh, has keratoconus, obvious keratoconus in one eye and not the other, uh, but that other eye has to be assumed to be having keratoconus or is not there yet, and it just hasn't progressed at the rate that the, the initial eye did. Uh, and you have to be suspect for keratoconus, the fellow eye, even though there are no clinical signs and or symptoms uh, with these patients. Central pachymetry, which was one of the um, determining factors of the diagnosis of keratoconus in most of our offices, uh, you know, we used to use a pachymeter and measure the thickness of the cornea. We used to say, oh, keratoconic corneas, they must be less than 500 microns, or they must be uh, a little bit more than 400 microns. But what's interesting is that central pachymetry is the least reliable indicator for diagnosis. Well, how do we know this? Well, remember that, that image of the child of the keratoconic patient that drove the parent into Dr. Iden's office, uh, that patient, while they may have had a uh, a pachymetry of 520 microns in the cornea, their maps were indicative of early disease uh, and maybe even early to mild uh, to moderate disease uh, based on the shape and the elevation of the cornea. 
And again, to reiterate, the placido-based topography analyzes the, the central anterior corneal surface, whereas tomography, which is what we're doing with a pentacam, analyzes the anterior and posterior cornea and produces a near full corneal thickness map. And that's really interesting because if you think about it, one pachymetry spot alone in the center of the cornea does not tell us that much information. Remember, if you look at your maps, typically keratoconic patients, their thin spot is inferior to the visual axis or inferior to the center of the cornea, uh, which are two completely different things in some patients. And so one of the things that we're looking for is how does that uh, pachymetry get thinner as it goes out into the periphery? Well, we know because the cornea is elliptical and we know that there is a, an average front surface curvature and an average back surface curvature, um, there should be a rough, um, smooth distribution of pachymetric distribution as you go from the center of the cornea out to the periphery. But in keratocones, that is not the case. And, and I, let me take that statement back. I don't like calling people keratocones. They're individuals with keratoconus. Uh, you know, we have to remember to, um, these are people that are walking into our office. These are people with lives, and we can't label them as a, a certain disease. We, they are individuals that just happen to have a certain disease. And I think that's really important to put the patient uh, back in the center, make these uh, patient-centric discussions. Um, so atasia progression, so this is the progression. This is not the diagnosis of keratoconus. This is the progression of ectasia that was defined by a consistent change in at least two of the following parameters. Uh, one was uh, progressive steepening of the anterior corneal surface. Number two was progressive steepening of the posterior corneal surface. And then number three was a progressive thinning and or increase in the rate of corneal thickness change from the periphery to the thinnest point. So remember, keratoconus is a disease. Ectasia is a process that's going on. This is really starting to bulge out and move and take on a more dynamic role. And from visit to visit, this is one of these are the changes that we're looking for. These changes need to be consistent over time and above the normal variability. Um, and progression is often accompanied by a decrease in best corrected uh, visual acuity uh, and a change to both uncorrected visual acuity and best corrected visual acuity is not required to document progression. Case in point, the patient that Dr. Iden was talking about before, while that patient's visual acuity was 2015 prior to when his cornea started to become keratoconic, uh, it was a completely different in shape and in thickness after he became keratoconic, yet his visual acuity uh, stayed consistent. So you don't have to have a decrease in visual acuity to diagnose a patient with keratoconus. We also know that there are significant risk factors for keratoconus, specifically Down syndrome, uh, relatives of affected patients, especially if they're young, uh, atopy and ocular allergy, uh, and that's a big one because, uh, you know, allergic conjunctivitis and allergic uh, conditions of the eye happen incredibly frequently, and these patients are typically eye rubbers, and I think Dr. Tulo will talk about eye rubbing. I know he loves to talk about uh, how he identifies patients in his office. Uh, there are ethnic factors, Asians and Arabians, uh, mechanical factors like, like eye rubbing. We talked about floppy eyelid syndrome and other connective tissue disorders. And remember, you know, keratoconus is a disease of the collagen. And, uh, you know, so these patients have collagen that is just not responding to stimuli as well as patients that have what we would consider normal uh, collagen. And that's one of the other reasons why I always think that this condition is, is really never unilateral but bilateral because the likelihood of the collagen in one eye being selectively poor as compared to the other eye just doesn't make sense. When I think about collagen disorders and collagen diseases of the body, you know, these collagen diseases don't just pick a knee or pick an elbow or pick a shoulder uh, to affect. They affect the entire body, and all joints are typically affected in varying degrees, but they're all affected because the collagen is dystrophic. And it's the same thing with keratoconus in the eyes. You may have one eye that's worse than the other, but don't think the collagen is selectively bad in one eye and not selectively bad in the other. It's still the same collagen in the same patient's body. 
So one of the things that they came up with is that they said that there was no direct relationship between keratoconus and dry eye, but I don't necessarily think that's the case. And in my experience, I happen to see a lot of dry eye, a lot of comorbidity between ocular surface disease and keratoconus. And the reason why I think that's the case is we all know that, uh, you know, the tear film loves to sit on that happy, perfectly curved uh, ace, uh, aspheric shape of the cornea, and that perfect shape uh, enables the tear film to actually hold its viscosity better and not break up like a tear breakup time would do it. But an irregularly shaped cornea does not provide that optimal aspheric surface. And I think, uh, based on my experience clinically, and I don't have a study to prove this, but in my experience, I think patients with corneas that are misshapen, especially the ones that are incredibly steep, uh, and incredibly, uh, you know, post high drops and all that kind of stuff, they have a much higher risk of uh, dry eye and ocular surface disease. But that's not what the patient, uh, the study found, and they do tell, uh, they do advise folks to use preservative-free artificial tears uh, for a couple of reasons. We don't want the preservative to act as a instigator for uh, eye rubbing. Um, also, aberometry can help us determine this because when light comes into the eye, uh, you know, it's bad enough that we have refractive error, lower order aberrations like sphere and cylinder, but keratoconus really starts to aberrate light as it comes into the eye and distort light uh, moving around. And I'm going to uh, wrap up relatively soon here just to move forward because uh, I know Dr. Tulo has to get in at least 10 minutes or so and then we need time for question and answer. But I will say that there are both genetic and environmental factors that have been associated with the disease, uh, and it's really, really, really important to have, uh, you know, in our office, one of the things that we have is, you know, when we diagnose somebody with a, with a condition like keratoconus, uh, we have the handy-dandy, uh, you know, one of our good friends of the, of the International Keratoconus Academy is the um, National Keratoconus Foundation, NKCF, and the website for them is nkcf.org, and they have these wonderful pamphlets, both in English and in Spanish, that can explain in patient language what their disease is and why they need to take care of themselves, why they need, they need, need cross-linking, why they need follow-ups, why they need better optical devices like scleral contact lenses and the sort. Uh, but one of the things that we have to give these patients, other than these information brochures from NKCF, is a family packet, and I can't tell you how important uh, that is in the identification of the disease to take these patients and uh, these individuals with the condition and give them information so their genetic family members can understand this as well, because the likelihood is uh, they could be affected uh, just like Dr. Iden was talking about earlier. Uh, we think it's an apoptotic-like mechanism where the tissue starts to break down, whether uh, the patient likes it or not, this, this process starts. Um, they have, in the last six years, there's been tons of studies that have related keratoconus to other changes in tissue, like tear proteins, proteases, cytokines, and in other inflammatory mediators. Um, and one of the things that we always have to remember is that this is the most common cornea ectatic disorder. It affects all ethnic groups. It affects both genders. Uh, it's, uh, there's environmental and genetic factors uh, that, may condition, that may contribute to its uh, a pathogenesis. And in the genetic testing, we have learned that there have been a number of genes that have been discovered um, to help identify this. And on that note, I'm actually going to turn it over to Dr. Tulo because I know he has some similar uh, slides. Um, Dr. Tulo, are you there? I am here. Thank you, Andy. All right. I'm going to turn it over to you right now. And if I could ask you, uh, I specifically left out uh, prevalence rate of keratoconus. I think that's really something that we need to discuss and what it was and, and what it is today. And I hope that you can uh, answer that question for the gang over here. Sure. I just want to ask the crew if they can see my first slide. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Tulo, uh, I can hear you good and uh, your slide looks good. I think you're ready to go. Thank you, Dr. Morgenstern. Excellent. And Andy, thank you very much. Um, and I will mention before I start my slide that uh, the topic Andy said because I think the the prevalence uh, of keratoconus question is a very fascinating question. Um, if you go to uh, most literature quotes right now, you'll see a, a quote of one in 2,000 patients are diagnosed with keratoconus. And I think most of us, uh, depending on where you practice, that number can vary quite considerably. In fact, we know when we look at the little research that's been published, it really is very specific to the patient population that's studied. 
for example, when you look at, at patient populations in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, you'll see a much, much higher incidence of keratoconus versus a much more homogeneous population like the United States where you'll see a, a, a lower incidence. Nevertheless, even in the United States, the incidence of keratoconus, in most people's opinion, is much higher than one in 2,000. And probably it depends on your practice modality. A primary care optometric practice, I'd probably estimate the percentage of being somewhere in one in 1,000. In a refractive surgery practice, that number can be much, much higher, as, as low as one in 50. So again, it depends on how you practice, where you practice, um, on how often you may see a patient with keratoconus. But it also depends on the tools you have. Historically, um, most optometrists have not had access to the advanced tools that we now have available in many clinics of making the early diagnosis of keratoconus. And historically, the early diagnosis of subclinical or mild keratoconus really wasn't that crucial because we didn't have tools to help stop the progression. So whether it was there or not really didn't impact the patient very much because the choices were contacts and glasses pretty much, and in severe cases, corneal transplants. Today, with cross-linking and other technologies, we have the ability to halt the progression before vision's loss. So it really changes the paradigm, as Barry said earlier, that how important it is to look for the disease before the disease finds us. Historically, in our practices, we would learn about patients with keratoconus after they've lost best corrected vision when we could no longer refract them in our traditional foropter techniques. And then we would make the diagnosis. We would fit them eventually with contact lenses. And then eventually, on a small percentage of patients, if it got really severe, we would send them out for a surgical consult for a corneal transplant. Today, I think we need to start to look at this disease in a totally different way, and we need to search for it. In other countries, where cross-linking has been available for decades, um, certain technologies like uh, tomography and topography have become part of the routine screening process for pediatric patients to look for this disease so that we can treat it before vision is lost. But today, in the United States, a lot of this technology is not easily available. So what can we do from a low-tech point of view? Here's a picture of a corneo. And our, one of our great tools that we have for making diagnosis in every optometric practice is the slit lamp. And the slit lamp is a very powerful tool. And here you see on the left a picture of a thin cornea. But again, observe that this is a moderate to severe patient with keratoconus, certainly not an early case of keratoconus. And we know even the best observers and patients and doctors like Barry and Andy and myself that have seen thousands of patients with keratoconus, the earliest cases are virtually impossible to detect with just a slit lamp alone. But nevertheless, a slit lamp is an important tool and it's something we should use to carefully look for patients, for patients thinning of their corneas. We also, a lot of our, our clinics have sound picometers. Unfortunately, though, ultrasound picometers only measure a single, single spot in the cornea. And oftentimes, keratoconus thinning can happen outside the center of the cornea, very easily missed with a handheld picometer. As you see in this photograph on the, on the right side, this is a pachymetric map made by an orb scan uh, topographer. And you see here where we can map the whole cornea so no corneal thinning points would be missed. So again, thin corneas are a characteristic of keratoconus, but early keratoconus is not easily diagnosed with a slit lamp. Well, what about Fleischer's ring? We've all known about Fleischer's ring where we see uh, hemosiderin deposited in the epithelium due to the abnormal shape the cornea takes and the tears pool on the cornea. The best way to see this is if you put the blue rat and filter in your slit lamp and look for it. Sometimes it's not a full ring all the way around. In the earliest stages, it can be a partial ring, typically beginning on that inferior smile as you see on this photograph here. Um, there's been literature saying that uh, more than 50% of cases have partial or complete Fleischer rings. But again, in the most earliest forms, you will not see uh, a Fleischer's ring. So great to diagnose on moderate to severe cases, not so good on the early cases. What about corneal stria? Well, corneal stria, again, uh, folds and decimate membranes. We see this commonly, again, in patients with keratoconus. It's fairly easy to see in the slit lamp. But again, not something obvious in early cases of keratoconus, something we only see in our moderate to severe cases. And again, um, if this is our only means of diagnosis, again, it's still a very important way to do it, but not great 
and getting that diagnosis made before vision is affected. Colonial scarring, well, we know colonial scarring is also a late onset condition, easily diagnosed with a slit lamp. We saw in a CLEC study that 53% had uh, patients had one or both eyes with some corneal scarring, and we know that over time the corneal scarring tends to worsen. Um, here's an example of a patient that starts off with very tiny, mild amount of scarring, and patient, if you look at them one year later, you can see here how these breaks in decimase membrane can go on to cause more and more scarring of the patient, and if it's within the pupil, which it often is, it can have some significant visual effects on the patient. And, from the CLEC study, you just see here just the incidence of void stria, Fleischer's ring, and corneal scarring. But unfortunately, all three of these signs, while excellent at diagnosing moderate to severe keratoconus, are not very good at diagnosing the early disease before vision is lost. We also, some other signs we can see in the cell lamp that are common in patients with keratoconus is that increased visibility of the corneal nerve plexus. And again, this is something that um, can become quite obvious with keratoconus, but again, not in the most early stages of the disease. What about Munson signs? It's the deflection of the lower lid when the patient looks down with keratoconus. You see an example here of a patient with prominent Munson sign. Again, not a good early detection device. Um, for the disease. Obviously, a patient with corneal high drops is a, is, a mo, is a most advanced stage of the disease, a patient likely to go on to need a corneal transplant uh, via those ruptures in decimase membrane. Um, what else can we see? Well, if you we look carefully at the epithelium of patients, even patients who do not wear contact lenses, if we put some fluorescein dye in their eyes and come back a minute or two later when most of the dye is gone, here's an exec, uh, excellent example of either hurricane or world keratopathy, characterized by the epithelial cell's inability to form that normal layer over the cornea, um, having a hard time climbing up that steep hill that's formed by the keratoconic thin and steepened cornea. Um, and this is just a nice example of what that might look like. What about your ophthalmoscope? It's still an excellent tool. And I think if you use your direct ophthalmoscope to look at dilated pupil, you can often see that distortion of the cornea, um, that Charlo oil droplet sign, if you put your ophthalmoscope on plus, just like you would if you were looking at a cataract or a pacification in the crystal lens, if you look at the cornea, you can also see that distortion available. And here's a nice retro illumination of a bilateral patient with bilateral keratoconus, obviously much more severe in the left eye than the right eye. Another sign you can use with your slit lamp, again, is Rizzuti sign. Rizzuti sign is the fact that when you put a parallel pipette at the limbus on one side of the eye, the opposite side of the eye, the normal cornea should illuminate. When the cornea is irregular or thinned, you'll have an absence of that transfer of light to the fellow limbus. And here you see the example where the uh, fellow limbus is dark and not lit. What about manual keratomenas? They can be extremely useful. Again, in cases of moderate to severe keratoconus, you'll notice it gets very difficult to line up those plus and minus signs. And as the disease progresses, you see that distortion of the rings that you can see, observe as, as you take the images. But again, in the very earliest stages of keratoconus, keratometry will be totally, totally normal. And again, with retinoscopy, you can see that, again, that Charlotte oil droplet sign. And then also you can see, even in some mild to moderate cases, some scissor reflex, but still not the best tool. But again, I would emphasize all these tools are something that I would use in my primary practice um, if I didn't have immediate access to the advanced technology we're going to talk more about later. So what can we do in our practice if we don't have the fancy OCTs and pentacamps that we're going to talk more about in our next lecture. Well, one of the things that we've learned uh, more recently is the effect that early keratoconus has on visual acuity. One of the things that we know, again, this is a disease of asymmetry. And knowing that they're asymmetric it can help you make this diagnosis early. And what we see, some of the earliest things that are affected is quality of vision. We see high contrast visual acuity decrease in one eye more than the other. We also see low contrast acuity affected even more so. So if you have the ability to do low contrast visual acuity, that can help pick this up early. Also differences in steepness of Ks from right to left eye, differences in the actual corneal astigmatism from right to left eye. So again, 
The amount of asymmetry is generally correlated with the severity of the disease, but even in early disease, we can see some very subtle asymmetric reductions in best corrected vision. So one of the things that I teach all of my doctors that I work with is when you're looking for keratoconus, look at the best corrected vision of patients very carefully. A patient who's a minus three sphere in both eyes should have symmetrical best corrected vision. They should be 20-20 in both eyes. If one eye is 20-20 and one eye is 20-20 minus three or 20-25 plus two, there should be a reason if the tear film is normal, there should be a reason to explain these asymmetries and acuities and it warrants further inspection. So in summary, what can we do in a primary care practice if we don't have access to a lot of the fancy equipment we're going to talk about in the next uh, webinar? Uh, number one is look for frequent refractive changes. Young patients, particularly um, in their first and second decade of life that have large asymmetric changes in refractive error, typically in the myopic area, but even more importantly, astigmatic changes that are asymmetric. Be on the lookout for that. Again, family history. Andy touched upon the family history, the importance of asking, does, does your mother, does your father, does your siblings have keratoconus? Measure the siblings. Get to, get to know the family. We know if patients have a, a close relative with keratoconus, the chances that they may get it at one point is about 400% greater. And Andy mentioned eye rubbing, and I know eye rubbing is something that I always ask about when I suspect keratoconus, and that's something that every doctor can do. And what we see patients with keratoconus tend to not only rub their eyes often and a lot, but they do something different than patients without keratoconus do. They tend to rub their eyes with their palm of their hands or the fist versus their fingertips. So I'll ask patients that I suspect keratoconus, show me how you rub your eyes, and ask their spouses about how they rub their eyes, because many patients are simply not aware of that. And again, those significant differences in astigmatism, and again, importantly, corneal astigmatism between the two eyes. In my mind, whenever I reach one diopter difference between the two eyes, that warrants further testing for me, especially in a young patient. Look at those K readings. Look for that distortion. If you are, if you are having a technician do K readings for you, make sure they know that if they are distorted to let you know about that. Use your retinoscope. Retinoscope, again, with that scissor reflex. Look for the subtle loss of best corrective vision, any asymmetry. And finally, again, even though you may not have aberrometry to measure on a patient, symptoms of patients with high order aberrations. We know that keratoconus tends to produce coma, in particular vertical coma, on patients. Look for these symptoms, these subtle monocular shadows, subtle, subtle astigmatism that can't be corrected with a foropter. This non-orthogonal astigmatism will cause these shadows that will not go away even after your refraction is done, and they tend to be asymmetric, mostly in one eye only at the early disease. So with that, I want to conclude, and I want to thank Barry, I want to thank Andy, I want to thank Clark, who will be here next week or the week after, and most of all, I want to thank Oculus for supporting us and getting the message out and helping um, add to the education for doctors uh, that treat patients with keratoconus. So again, thank you, and have a great evening, and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Tulo and Dr. Morgenstein. Thank you, Dr. Iden. Thank you. Um, great presentations. Um, just real quick before we get into the the questions, I just wanted to uh, really quickly um, show some information on Oculus here. So. For those of you that um, joined the, the webinar late, um, or if you're interested in looking at any other clinical webinars that Oculus has done, we do uh, ones about once a month. You can go to our website at Oculus uh, www.oculususa.com. We also have another website um, where we have uh, live presentations uh, that are, are video recorded, and that's www.oculus.oculustv.com. Uh, Oculus and then if you have any uh, questions regarding our products, whether it's, it's um, 
regarding a questions or whether it's regarding a product demonstration, you can contact us at sales at oculususa.com. And then I have our 1-800 number there as well. And if you're a current Oculus customer, you can always uh, contact us for service at service at oculususa.com. And then that would be the same 1-800 number there. Uh, so again, thank you very much, guys. Great presentations. Um, I do have some questions here for you uh, if we have some time. Fire away. We're ready. Okay, so uh, first question here. Uh, typically, weakness and thinning occurs below midline and rarely above midline. What have keratoconus experts thought of contributing factors related to lid tension or gravity effect or secondary dry eye syndrome and not interocular pressures? Bill, do you want to tackle that one? Well, I'll start off by saying that the literature has really... Um, up to this time has not found any correlation with dry eye and, uh, and keratoconus. It, it, there, there's no um, comorbidity established at this point. Nevertheless, it's correct, the majority of keratoconus is inferior and inferior temporal and um, would seem likely to have something to do with either gravity, eyelids, um, uh, but the, the, but the uh, correlation has not been firmly established yet. But it would make sense that this probably is a connection that we just haven't discovered yet. However, I will, yeah, I, I would add, and I completely agree with you, um, I would add that there have been very unique cases of keratoconus that we've actually seen the steepening at the superior portion of the cornea. Um, and so really, we have no explanation why that's the case, um, if it's truly a keratoconic cornea or not, or some other... Um, kind of rogue corneal condition, um, or it may be keratoconus and just in an, in an awkward place. But the fact that uh, you know the condition does take place below the visual axis, below the pupillary axis, or in, within the visual uh, pupillary axis, but just below center, um, I mean, it just makes a hell of a lot of sense to me that it would uh, there there has to be some uh, input from gravity on that one. But I will also say, yeah, I would also say, you know, we don't see um, uh, you know, keratoconus going all the way out to the limbus, uh, you know, that would be uh, typical of, of other conditions. Um, and, you know, if gravity was a factor, why in the most significant or the most serious cases or the, or the most, uh, you know, terrible cases of keratoconus, why doesn't it migrate down further uh, would be the only question I would ask. But, you know, I, the answer is, like Bill said, we just don't have literature on it. Andy, it's clearly a complex multifactorial problem, and, and that's why we haven't figured it out yet. I think the interesting thing is that every case of keratoconus has a central point that radiates out from, and the disease typically will affect anywhere between a 4 and 5 millimeter uh, uh, diameter of the cornea, and usually not beyond that, um, which is very interesting. So there's obviously there's an origin point, and then there's a point from there that it affects the cornea, and as you said, in, in true keratoconus, it does not affect the whole cornea, so it's very interesting. Yet we see in corneal transplants where patients who are transplanted normal corneas will redevelop keratoconus. So there's obviously some, some mechanism that we clearly don't understand. Good question, though. Uh, next one, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Dr. Tulo, uh, you mentioned that oral keratopathy can occur even without contact lens wear. How would I know whether such a staining pattern indicates a need to refit the corneal contact lens? Actually, I think Barry is probably the best suited to answer this question, but I'll give you my answer and then pass that one back to Barry. Um, as far as refitting the contact lens, to me, is when you have um, significant world keratopathy in addition to central corneal staining. If you have apical touch on a contact lens, if it's, if it's a rigid uh, lens fit and you have significant apical touch, I think those are those are times where I may have to sacrifice quality of vision. Um, the reason why we fit lenses so fly is to get great vision, but the consequence of that is often the exasperation of the, the epithelial keratopathy. So, um, I go by I, I go by the staining of the cornea, and if I see any progression of that, um, it's time to refit the lens and maybe even go to a more complex design such as a scleral lens or a hybrid lens. Barry, what, what, how would you answer that question? 
So just I, Barry just texted me. He's having technical difficulties. He he actually uh, his computer dropped off. Uh, he's trying to get back on as we speak right now. Um, I will add though that um, the, the, that kind of hurricane keratopathy that you were talking about. Um, it, I think it's really important to stay in these patients and kind of understand what those epithelial cells are trying to do. When you know Bill had that picture up of that kind of whirl hurricane style keratopathy. Um, it makes sense, you know, when you have these steeper corneas, uh, to take a look at um, the pattern that the epithelial cells, you know, we know what a normal epithelial cell migration is. They start at the limbus and it, you know, migrates uh, towards the center. If you've ever seen, uh, you know, a post-abrasion patient or a post-PRK patient, you can, you can actually see the migration of these epithelial cells that go climb right up that, that hill of that cornea and meet right in the center. Well, you know, it, it, it's really unique to me and really amazing. If you think about uh, hiking up an incredibly steep hill, you know, people that hike up incredibly steep mountains, they don't go straight up the side. They go around the mountain and around the mountain. It might take a lot longer time, but they'll eventually get to the top, and it's not so steep of a climb. And that's the kind of epithelial migration pattern difference that these epithelial cells, I believe, are going through. Uh, and that's why recovery from an abrasion on a... Uh, um, uh, keratocone, an individual keratoconus, is so much different than a, an eye that does not have keratoconus. Um, and that, we will discuss in the future, is one of my arguments uh, for epithelium on cross-linking because the visual recovery of the patient is so much more rapid uh, than in the patient with uh, epi-off. We're not going to get into that discussion tonight because, quite frankly, we don't have our boxing gloves on and not enough time uh, to handle that one right now. But um, in any event, I think it's really important to stain every single one of your patients with keratoconus and look for that epithelial migration pattern that you might be able to dig up, which is abnormal to a cornea that has a migration pattern that is, uh, you know, makes a beeline toward the center of the cornea. And two key points to add to that, Andy, is number one is when you do stain these patients, do not look right away. When all the fluorescein's in the eye, it'll be easily missed. You've got to wait and let the fluorescein uh, uh, go away. So I usually wait at least 90 seconds before I go back and look for the world keratopathy. Um, number two, we also now have advanced techniques that we'll, Barry will talk about more, where with ultrasound we can measure corneal th thickness of the epithelium across the whole cornea, and it's been conclusively shown that there is uh, a thinning, central thinning of the epithelial cornea as keratoconus develops. In fact, we see patients now with, with, with epithelium as thin as 5 and 10 microns on the more moderate to advanced cases. So we'll talk more about that in future presentations. Bill, what, what would it, just to give everybody a uh, sense of, uh, for those people who don't know what a normal epithelial thickness is, uh, what would you consider a normal epithelial thickness? Typically it's between 45 and 60 microns. Gotcha. So it's significant change, obviously. Significantly better, yeah. La can we do the uh, last question, Chris, because I know we're running out of time. Sure. Um, I actually have... Um a couple that are, are somewhat related and they're more uh, clinical, so I wanted to ask these ones. At what point is asymmetric refraction concerning to you? And I'll just follow up with the other one. At what point is myopic progression concerning to you? Bill, do you want to handle the first one? I'll handle the myopic one. Sure. As far as asymmetric astigmatism, to me, my, my trigger is one, di <clears throat> sorry, one diopter. So when I see my, my comparison, and again, I'll, I'll emphasize corneal astigmatism, so my K-readings, um, when there's a diopter difference between the two eyes, that's a trigger for me to now start a keratoconic investigation. I need to now pull out some of the, the, the heavier weapons to, to look for the disease. Um, so that's my cutoff, and that cutoff has gone down over time, and I suspect that it's going to go down even more um, and, and maybe go down to 0.75 as, as we become better at detecting this condition. Andy? Uh, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Um, whereas asymmetry is kind of, a, to me, a much easier label to put on a, an individual that may or may not have keratoconus, or um, I think the asymmetry between two refractions is much more indicative of something that is, uh, you know, outside of our normal standard deviation. Myopic progression, you know, that's an interesting bird because uh, number one, you know, we live in an age right now, you can't really put down, uh, you can't really pick up a uh, optometric or ophthalmologic uh, journal these days without looking at um, rates of myopia that are increasing out of control in epidemic proportions right now. 
uh, it, especially in certain you know areas of the world. Um, and we're, you know with with a Panicam and with these devices where we can identify these diseases earlier, you know um, you have a condition you know myopia that could that be indicative of keratoconic uh, disease? Absolutely. Could progressive myopia be indicative of progressive myopia? Absolutely. So um, because of the rates of myopia around the world are out of control, typically in our in our pediatric population, which is the most at risk population for keratoconus and the the the, the population that we need to treat the most aggressively, um, it's it's hard to identify what the problem is that's going on. More the reason to take a look at the back surface of the cornea because in an axial myope. In, an, uh, in a cornea that's non-keratoconic and the patient, the, the pediatric patient has axial myopia, typically you won't see elevation change on the back side of the cornea. But in a patient that is keratoconic, you would see that posterior shape change. Now, in an axial myope, remember, you might not see uh, that much change in the uh, front surface curvature as well. Uh, and in, in some uh, keratoconic patients that are myopes that are progressing, where they have the posterior surface change first, you may not see that curvature change either. So the reality is, is that I don't believe the progression of myopia is clinically indicative of uh, the disease of keratoconus or, or ectasia. Uh, I definitely think it's a risk factor, uh, but I think uh, the use of a device that can look at the back surface of the cornea um, is really the only thing that, uh, that's going to differentiate to me these early myopes, progressive myopes, versus an early individual with uh, keratoconus. Bill, what do you think? Andy, one more thing I would add with the astigmatism um, detection is that certainly when I find astigmatism that's either oblique or against the rule, I'm much more concerned about the condition of keratoconus than what I find with the rule astigmatism. So again, the, the, the angle of the astigmatism also is a risk factor. Um, for patients also. And whenever I see against the rule of stigmatism, I'm even more concerned about the variant of keratoconus called pellucid marginal degeneration and pay a particular attention to that inferior limbus. And, you know, just to wrap up over here, and I'm going to make a statement, and I, I really hope that Bill's going to agree with me on this, and he's more than happy to disagree with me on it. Um, but the most, if you're going to take anything away from this presentation tonight, and possibly all three presentations, I think the most important thing that we need to understand that uh, segment our understanding of keratoconus in 2016 is this. Number one, we identify this disease at the youngest age possible. And if you do identify this disease in a young individual, in a pediatric individual, you have to be way more aggressive in your follow-up to look for progression and way more aggressive in uh, the, uh, the recommendation to potentially cross-link these patients uh, because you have the ability to stop these things from getting worse. The question is it is it a is it a question is it is it is it a maybe it's not a maybe it is it's it's this is a procedure that's FDA approved in this country we have the data we have all the information and uh, uh, pleading ignorance is not really a uh, you know an excuse anymore because we have so much information uh, that tells us what what the proper uh, methods to handle these patients are so if you're going to take anything away from this entire series. Identification of these these individuals with disease at the earliest age possible and recommendation um, to treat to stop them from getting worse. That's the key to keratoconus in 2016 and beyond. Bill, I, I'm going to open that up and see if you would agree with me, disagree, or add anything to it. So my clo closing comments is, unfortunately, Andy, I do agree with you. It's more fun when we don't agree, um, but I do agree with you. I think really my take-home message again is, unfortunately, and we'll talk much more about cross-linking later down the road. Um, Cross-linking cannot reliably reverse loss of best corrected vision. It can reliably freeze the cornea and stop progression, but today's cross-linking cannot reverse predictably the loss of vision. Um, so because of that, we can't wait till patients lose vision to figure out that they have keratoconus. We've got to make the diagnosis as early as possible. It, now that we have access to, the, to, to these treatments, it's imperative that we do this for our patients. It's, 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 it's our obligation. So again, I want to thank everyone again, and uh, we'd be happy, our email addresses were posted. If you have any more questions, we'd be happy to answer them for you offline. 
So, gentlemen, thank you very much. Again, I do actually have a couple other questions but that I'm going to go ahead and email you guys, um, forward them to you, and, and you guys can hopefully email uh, those those doctors back. Um, to those of you joining us as as um, as participants or as as um, registrants, thank you very much. Um, please remember that this is the the first part in a three part webcast series and we will be on again next Wednesday at the same time and I believe Dr. Iden and Dr. Tulo are going to go into more advanced diagnostic techniques and, and diagnostic modalities that are out there. So again, uh, International Keratoconus Academy, thank you very much and thank you everybody for listening and good night. <laughs>